I've got my coffee. Oh, good, good. I got my uh, ACV, apple cider vinegar. Very uh, trendy. You sure it's yes. not gin and tonic? No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> but I drank Campari earlier. <laughs> so let's see. It should be live. I'm just, yeah, okay, good, 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 good. So we're live. We're live. Um, so thank you to everyone who's here. Today we have a special, special guest in the house, Paul Talbot Greaves. Thank you so, so much for being here. I really, really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Lero. Nice to, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to finally talk. I've been following your work for a while now, and I love it. So just before we get into it, I just want to make sure everyone in the chat, just let us know if there's any audio issues, video issues, anything, and I'll, I'll monitor that and make sure that we're good. Uh, and with that, I think we can get started. So, Paul, do you like that? I changed the branding of the live stream. Everything is green just for you. Because <laughs> uh, I thought it would complement everything. Uh, usually I go with purple. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> okay. So you'll when you'll see the live stream uh, afterwards, you'll you'll see everything is kind of green. Um, so I want to start actually with uh, showing a couple of paintings for the three people that aren't familiar with your work. Um, and just go over them real quick and, and yeah. share because I absolutely love uh, your work. So this one, uh, Farm in the Valley, I believe, recently won wow. a prize. Yeah. Yeah, that one's really fantastic. Now, I also added this one, which I know you have a special connection to the place itself. Cool. Is that so? I did some, yeah. some detective work. Um, did. I'm a big fan of the snowy scapes. Sure. Acrylic soils. Everything. So for the people who aren't familiar, your work is it's just great. And I think uh, one of the main things that I notice is that you're a master at directing and kind of commanding the viewer's attention when it comes to edges, especially with foliage, which is something that is really, really, uh, I think, hard to do. Uh, so that's one thing that definitely inspires me. So let's get a bit back to us a bit. So I like to start these with asking the most important question. Uh, Paul, what's your uh, favorite color? Oh, my favorite color. Well, um, I have a few guesses. You've got a few guesses. I might surprise you. Um, I'm going to say cerulean blue. Nice. What a twist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. in my research, yeah. I saw the orange blue green combination. So I knew yeah. there may be a, a blue there. Now, if I were oh, to ask you, what's your favorite green? Favorite green? Yes. What, as in, um, as in a, a brand, as a, a, a named green? Yeah. Or, or just a, a named green. or kind of warm, cool shade. Yeah. Yes. Well, the, the green I use the most is um, a permanent sap green. And I find that certainly for UK greens, that's more natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I love it. I love it. One of my favorites, too, and very useful, too, which is yeah. important. Uh, yeah. So to everyone who joined now, uh, we have Paul Talbot Reeves in the house. Tom Dancer says Paul's a little quiet. Otherwise, good. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. I'll, I'll talk more quietly. So if you can just raise, increase the volume on your computers, and we'll, we'll be good. Uh, so Paul, actually, the way I like to start these is by talking a bit about the origin story or kind of the history. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually curious about uh, Paul as a, as a kid. I know you grew up in Yorkshire, Yorkshire Hills. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering, were you artistic? Did you create? Yeah, all the time, all the time from being really small. Um, you know, I can remember visiting grandparents and they were switched on. So they, the first thing they do is hand me some crayons and paper. Hmm. I'd sit around the back of the couch drawing, you know, whilst the adults talked. Nice. Uh, yeah, and always uh, I was winning coloring competitions, you know, the sort of stuff we do as children. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, at, at one point I was winning so many coloring competitions, I thought I was the only person entering. <laughs> <laughs> Were you? No, well, I don't think I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, always, I mean, my childhood was full of um, creativity. Yeah. And I think that back then it was really a reward was a reward. It's not like a seventh, eighth, a seventh place trophy or something like that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I mean, even from being a small child, I knew I would be an artist. I had this hmm. inner voice that always told me I would be an artist. So there was never any question for me 
what I was going to do in my life, you know. That's amazing. That's amazing to hear. I kind of knew that I had this maybe a small gift or inclination towards it, but I was never like I knew. Do, do you feel like you had that that kind of understanding at a very young age, like six years old? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, it, it's, and, 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 you know, progressing through the education system, um, people try and fit you into boxes and make you do things maybe you don't really want to do, you know, they sort of was looking at your best interest, but, but always for me, the focus was um, artist. I was always going to be an artist. And I knew it wasn't mm. going to be an easy journey getting there, but uh, mm. yeah, that was, that was my, that was my focus. Yeah. All through my, all through my growing years. That's amazing. There's actually a lot to unpack when it comes to the educational system. And I, I was, I feel like I've never been pushed in that direction. I wish I have, but on the other hand, what are you going to do? It, it all brings you to the place where you're at uh, in a way. So yeah. I know that at some point, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, I was never pushed in that direction. I was mm, you know. actually persuaded not to do that. You know, people tried their best to, to sort of give me the best advice that, well, you don't want to be an artist. You know? and, um, I just, uh, I just kick back at that. I think everyone <laughs> should be encouraged to do what they're strong at. Yeah. And that's where you'll find the best rewards and where you can bring yeah. the most value. Everything else is really a waste of time in a way. Absolutely. And I never felt, for example, the, the reason to go to some art college or anything like that, because I, I also knew, for me, I knew what, what kind of art I want to do. And if you know that and you know the set of skills and where to acquire them, you don't really need a program from someone else. You can build your own. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's really what I've done. And um, I did go to art college. I went to I went to art college in eighty five and mm -hmm. that was a two year course and then and then obviously progressed to university from there, but I I didn't do the university. Um <laughs> so I I spent my time drawing and painting on my own. So I know at some point you were a graphic artist, is that correct? Yeah, I worked in, in after I left art college, I worked in, in graphics in a printing company. Um and then and then just sort of progressed through other other jobs, it really is a way of paying bills whilst I was learning my craft, you know, and um, and that's that's kind of how it how it sort of developed. Hmm. That's interesting. So it sounds like you had a pretty good plan and kind of understanding of the of the transition or the way you want to tackle becoming a professional artist and doing the type of art you want. No great plan. Um, it was, other than other than I knew I was going to be an artist, I think I just I just kind of left my destiny to fate. You know, it was um, that although I had this sort of inner guide, like like you might have a compass and find your way, um, I didn't really have a map. Mm -hmm. So so I, I was going in the right direction, but but you know I wavered a bit and um, and just gradually found my way, which is not a bad thing. It's, I think you learn quite a lot on the on that journey. Definitely. You can always always connect the dots, but only after the fact. When you're in it, right. you, it's usually enough to know the next step from my experience and then to go for it, to actually go for it. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so then you made a transition to, was it gradual to painting, to actual watercolor, oil, acrylics? How did that kind of unfold? Um, yeah, I started... At I started when I when I was doing the the graphics. I was kind of really into a lot of detail stuff. So, around about that time, I was using a lot of um, like pen and ink drawing and really fine graphical pen and ink drawing. And I and I loved sort of depicting the landscape mm -hmm. in that way. And then and then I started to get interested in in watercolor and and using watercolor, um, just picking up local influences and tying that together with my interest in the landscape because, you know, I love being outdoors. I'm a, I'm a walker, a mountaineer, um, mm -hmm. mountain biker, you know, sort of always mm -hmm. outdoors. And, um, and so the, the two, when I was out walking, I was, I was, and then I was, I spent a lot of time in the mountains in those days, um, and started sort of painting the mountains. And that's really when I got hooked on, on watercolor, but it was very, 
it was very sort of traditional English watercolours when I started, you know, the really sort of mm. tiny stuff and careful, yeah. and very pale washes. <laughs> and I was doing what I thought you were supposed to do until I realised I had a choice and I could do what I wanted to do. I was more interested in the American Chinese painters, mm. the real bold, heavy colour, the contrast, you know, that's what really grab my interest so did it blow your mind the first time you saw it and you were like that's possible yeah 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 it was like wow that is you know when something speaks to you that's really what what sort of hooked me in and and once I started then painting contrast because that's essentially what fires me as a painter mm -hmm. um then then I was yeah I really found my vocation then yeah, something I noticed about your works for sure, it's the contrast. And it's it's not only one type of contrast, it's the getting the subtleties and how contrasted it is, and also the patterns of light and shadow, which I find fascinating. Cast shadows, how they interact with the environment, that kind of a thing, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You get all the lovely profiles of the landscape. <laughs> and you get... That's the... right, sorry. <laughs> you get the soft shapes. <laughs> the dog's excited there later on. Uh, yeah, you get all the soft shapes of the shadows, you know, it's like all the different edges, the colors in there, the strengths, and, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it brings out the, the real sort of bold sunlight feel, which is what I like to um, sort of do in my work. There's a lot that goes into composing a painting, and, and there's a lot that you can get wrong. And it doesn't mean that if you get one or two things wrong, you fail, but to make something that's truly, you look at it and you're, wow, there's a lot that goes into that, right? I mean, the composition, the edges, the colors, the overall connection of everything. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if there was one thing that that I sort of brought from art college days was um, design, you know, that mm -hmm. really, the real importance of, of that foundation and I've always stuck with that that's that's my sort of core principle is working on that design it's not just picking something nice to paint um you know I, I filter things out and I may collect you know 50 60 images to that, that I think might be interesting but I might only create five or six paintings out of those hmm. so it's, there's a real strong filter as to what gets through and what doesn't um, but yeah, I, I really sort of lean heavily on composition. Interesting. Do you feel, is plein air a big part of it for you? Uh, well, not plein air painting. I, no. I tend to be more of a studio painter. Um, and, and I do take a lot of photographs. I work a lot from photographs, but I, I, I like to seek out the different things. So, so I'm, I'm not sort of there picking out traditional compositions I, I look for obscure things or you know different angles looking at things in a different way maybe introducing mm -hmm. the, the viewer to to look at something in that landscape that they wouldn't ordinarily think about and I get a lot of comments about that you know people say wow I would never have seen that and, and, mm -hmm. and that's really lovely that's fascinating. One of the things that I noticed personally in your work is you have these walls, stone walls, and that pattern of light on top of them that's kind of broken. That's something amazing that I would, would have never thought about. I'm also unfamiliar with these views. Now I am, after looking at so many of your paintings. Uh, but that's one of the things I really noticed. Uh, yeah, it's sure. very unique. Yeah. Um, if you ever visit Yorkshire, you will see that uh, those walls are absolutely everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. the, the enclosure acts that, that were in the uh, 19th century, um, lots and lots of field patterns lined in walls, stone walls, garden walls, the, the, they are everywhere. And mm -hmm. even on the moors where there's not much subject matter, there are lots of walls. Now I started painting those, not because I thought they'd make a great subject, um, because who's who's really that interested in a wall? <laughs> but it was purely because they, at the time when I was painting them, that they were the only things that gave some shadow and dimension. <laughs> and you get a lot of the, like you said, with the, those stones on the top, you get these dynamics, you know, and it's the the angles and the changing light and the reflections and things 
highlights and that that became really fascinating to me mm -hmm. but also the history of it i love all the history you know some of those walls are several hundred years old wow and, and i do i do um help a friend sometimes building them and you know if you're repairing a wall like that and you're pulling stones out you might be the first person to touch some of those stones in, in several <laughs> years, which is great. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> did, did building them and fixing them help you better paint them <laughs> in a way? More yeah, appreciation? You certainly understand it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of really getting involved with this subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the most, the most involvement. <laughs> I think after carrying heavy rocks, you have more like I have to portray them as something solid. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. Well, won't do them justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you get so, some so. the textures and the colors. And, yeah. Mm. So you you paint watercolor, oils, and acrylics. Am I correct? Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. Why is that? Um, I, I love the different aspects of each medium. So the softness of the oil, you know, and you get a very different feel when you work in that. Um, I love the, the really loose aspect of watercolor. So when I'm painting watercolor, you know, I, I have the board at an angle and I'm throwing water at it, I throw paint at it, um, and allow things mm. to run and spray it, I do all kinds of things to sort of break the edges, soften the edges. And, and, and I think the watercolor is great for capturing that energy. You know, it's a real amount of energy going into it each time and mm -hmm. then the acrylic sort of spans both of those i find it can bring some of the oil techniques in and some of the water color techniques and combine them you know so you might throw a bit of water into it or whatever a bit of medium at it and then and then straight in with some heavy paint like an oil and then you might use a thinner wash like watercolor so i love to do that i love playing around with with the different types mm -hmm. of approaches that's really interesting. And it's, I love that you actually enjoy all of them in different ways. I'm trying to yeah. talk really quietly because I see that uh, people say the volume is a little uh, quiet once again. Is there, can you get closer to the device? Is it a computer or a phone? I'm, I'm as close as I can be. And, uh, this is better. No, I think this is better. better. Okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. I wasn't expecting no a big gap, but people started writing in the chat. Okay. But they do enjoy it. What they hear, yeah. they enjoy. <laughs> so I'll try talking quietly. I, I was wondering if was there any kind of order or rhyme or reason to how you got into the different mediums? Uh, did you start with one and then added another? How did that come? Yeah, up? I started with watercolor, and I've painted watercolor now twenty five years, and then uh, then I started working in acrylic, and. I guess I was trying to use acrylic like oil to avoid the 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 way of you know to, well to avoid the messiness of oil if you like um, and then I realised that you can't replicate that you know um, hmm. so I, then I start painting oil and really enjoyed it found a way of and methods of working where where that's you know you can contain the the messiness doesn't have to be a, a messy medium and and yeah so that's kind of the progression that it's that it's gone into i love working with oil i hmm. think uh i think that could quite easily compete with the watercolor for me interesting and how long does does it take you for an oil painting not too long i only work them small um, mm -hmm. I, I mean my my watercolors are quite big they're usually half imperial size so mm. 22 by 15 inch or bigger. Um, now that one, that one there is uh, full imperial. It might wow. not look too big, but that's that's the <laughs> full imperial sheet. So um, so yeah, I work big in watercolor. In oil, I keep them small and controlled. So usually, it will take a couple of hours, something like that. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's crazy. Who's, do you have different inspirations for different mediums? other artists you uh, enjoy looking at or something like that? Not a huge amount. Um, I get asked this question a lot. People ask <laughs> me who my you know, favorite artists are and um, 
you say yourself i say myself <laughs> yeah i mean sure i like looking at people's work but i i try not to get influenced by other people's work i think it's really important if if you want to be a, an individual artist with a with your own style mm -hmm. to focus only on your own painting journey and working out your own painting problems so um, yeah. so yeah i don't have a huge amount of um sort of heroes that i follow or worship <laughs> or or try and emulate you know it could be a little bit of a trap yeah if you go too deep down the rabbit hole absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i agree I think, I think there is I think internet yeah. is um is great you know for learning but also it, it is a trap um mm -hmm. you, can, you can end up sort of emulating one person then moving on to another then moving to another and, and all the time that that's happening sure you might be learning technique but but mm -hmm. you know are you really learning to be you and, and that's, yeah. that's important for me one thing you you said that i love is that the idea of problem solving because it really is something you can't learn unless you paint a lot every day um so, this, so that's huge to me do you have um have you ever hit a serious plateau that you really had to work through if you have a strategy for that i'm curious yeah yeah um yeah i had a really bad down at one time it, it happens now and again and and you must know what happens in in these times later on i mean you know you're painting <laughs> a lot and uh, and you do lots of great work so i i the way i kind of see the whole journey is it's like going up a staircase so as you begin to to um learn you know the steps are very short so you you quickly learn a technique and you and you get excited and you move on to the next level and then the next level the next level but each step gets longer and harder to climb and um and one of the sort of upper steps of my staircase <laughs> I had a yeah, I had a really bad time. I think I just kind of lost my way a bit. Um, I had a disastrous exhibition, and and some not very kind comments and things came my wow. way. And yeah, I took it really personally. I What's the worst? It, I'm I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> a lot of people struggle, so yeah, sure. I d I actually wrote a really a really good article about it in the Artist Magazine here in the UK. And, um, I can remember standing in my studio with a paintbrush full of paint, crying my eyes out because I didn't know what to do with it. And it, yeah, it was, it was. And so what I did was I just canceled all my, all my appointments, everything. And then I shut the studio door, I bought in loads and loads of art materials. And I just set about trying things, being in, trying it, being it. And, and just, I suppose, being kind to myself and being me and came out of that a totally different artist. You know, it's like, yeah, it was a transformation. So if anybody does experience that, I think I think it is be kind to yourself and, and just, you know, step back a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Don't have too many expectations and and just work at it because that's part of development you know that was almost like a grieving process i left behind some of some mm. of who i was as a painter but but i came forward as a better painter so your current style is very indicative of that probably there's like a before and after in a way yeah yeah sure yeah and um <laughs> you know this sort of way that i work is really sort of quick and well, it would lend itself well to plein air, um, mm -hmm. but but also very brave, you know, and, and bold, and not afraid of making mistakes and just focusing on the important parts of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can definitely see that there is a lot of boldness in the way you build your washes and the way you connect things. And it's funny because I initially did think that a lot of it is done plein air, which is a huge compliment because that's the freshest looking work so i uh, you know and, and i'll ask a very selfish question especially with these vast green washes 
how do you keep them kind of fresh and interesting, regardless of getting a good flow and all of that? Yeah, so I mentioned I, I use the, the permanent sap green a lot. And that becomes my base green. Mm -hmm. um, and then I add into that different color, depending on what I want to achieve. So if it's a cooler green, I might sometimes mix uh, cerulean blue in with it. Um, on the painting. I'm always mixing on the surface, never mm. in the palette. I love that, yeah. So uh, then I'll add yellows. Um, I mean, you absorb and you kind of get used to the, your environment. So, you know, a lot of the grass here and foliage, you know, we get a bit of warmth in there. So maybe a touch of yellow ochre. And yeah, just constantly mixing them on the paper. But by using that, that single green as a base, you know, that, that keeps everything strong and fresh and vibrant. And um, yeah, there was a little bit of, uh, I, I don't know whether you call it uh, snobbery or something, but I, I remember at one time, you know, everybody said, oh, you, you should never use tube greens, which is why I use them, because I always go the other way. <laughs> That's excellent. That's actually excellent advice. Yeah. Are you, I'm curious because it's also relating to something you said earlier. Are you a competitive person by nature? No, no you don't consider Not yourself that. Not at all, no. no. With yourself? Well, with myself, I'm a, I am a, I am a perfectionist. So, so again, that filter comes in. If, if I painted something that I think is slightly under par, then it, it won't go out on social media. Maybe it's good, but, um, but yeah, it's just, um, I don't know, it's just how you built, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, because I could really relate to, you said you were kind of crying with the brush in hand. That's, that's something very competitive, whether it's with others or with yourself. Because I know that when I'm, when I don't feel like I'm, I'm able to crack with the thing I'm trying, I get very obsessed about it. And that's the thing that pulled me into watercolor in the first place, because he, it's such a slap in the face the first time you do it. Not for everyone, but for me it was. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're probably right. It was it, that particular moment was frustration. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. Probably knowing deep down that I wasn't where I wanted to be in my mm -hmm. journey. Yeah. There's an integrity aspect to it that you know that you can do better and if you post or publish anything that's below that it's really is a hit to the self-esteem in a way right yeah yeah sure what's the worst painting advice you ever got don't do it <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah, even yeah. get started painting yeah don't start you need to earn some money <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i it's... mean yeah we i think we still have a dim view about art and, and uh, you know as a, as a career um certainly now education system here it's all pushing for science and maths and that's great but you know hey there are artists out there there are dancers out there there are musicians out there you know let's let's all celebrate the the diversity of human race let's not just mm -hmm. be Mm -hmm. And that's the, they, they bring truly amazing things to the world for Absolutely. sure. They change the, you change the world with your paintings for Absolutely. sure. You know, some of the, I mean, as an artist, when you're working alone and you, you create paintings and, you know, you put them out there and you're selling them and, and yeah, it's a great buzz. Um, but some of the best feedback I get is, you know, and, and certainly in the pandemic, people have messaged and said, you know, please keep putting these paintings out there and brightening my day. And and that that to me keeps me going, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That appreciation for what you're doing. Yeah, I totally get it. It's it's really as people stuck inside, they need that escape in a way, for sure. Yeah. I saw you also do uh, abstract studies, which I was a bit curious about. You said you did a, a lot of iterations of it, um, around nine, I think. Uh, what what's that kind of a thing? How does that help you? The abstracts of I mean, I'm I'm very intrigued by abstract, and I find it very difficult because 
you know, I obviously have trained my eye to look beyond the abstract and yeah. look at the detail and and depict the sort of realism. Um, but you know, I start in an abstract way. I, I it's full of brush marks and just loose paint, and and then you start to look at people like Turner and what happened with him. You know, I mean, you know, as I'm as I'm getting a bit older now. My eyesight's going, you know, I need the glasses for the close-up stuff. But I'm sure if I if I didn't go to an optician and later in life my eyes would probably become even worse and, and therefore I wouldn't be able to see quite as well and, mm -hmm. and no doubt you know, things would become more abstract naturally in that way. So I'm fascinated by that. But but I, I think the more I work as an artist, the more I focus on those building blocks of painting. You know the colors the shapes the values and the edges those are the things that matter and mm -hmm. then the touches of detail on the end are just like the cherry on the top of the cake yeah yeah you don't always need that cherry you can have a cake without the cherry and that's what abstract is for me and and um yeah i, I think as time goes on i'll probably explore it a bit more mm. and you know when when you review paintings very often the thing that is off about them is really not the details it's about the entire thing together which is the hardest thing often to get and i would go on a limb and say that even if you you know god forbids your eyesight declines or anyone's eyesight declines you can actually once you get the overall shapes in you can make all the rest up people will think it's real yeah sure yeah absolutely and I, I find it fascinating how far you can take that abstraction too you know yeah yeah me too and um it's it's all about the personal depiction isn't it of what you mm -hmm. see in that yeah um, and i and you know i was doing a, a course of the week and i did a demonstration painting and in the background i said right there's some cars we'll paint these cars well you know all about cars Leon. <laughs> i love so, cars I've been your lovely cars and Thank you. Uh, uh, in the background i just left like a, a, a sliver of paper for the for the rear screen but everything mm -hmm. else was in shadow so it was all black so it was only a rectangle and uh, said right we'll just make this into a car and i put the two dots of <laughs> having red on you know what i mean and everyone was like oh my god you wow it's a car and it's and it's not a car it's a rectangle and two dots but we join yeah. that together don't we and that fascinates me is to how little you can leave out or how yeah. much you can leave out. And you surprise yourself sometimes with like the best work is something you just show kind of real fast because you're so much in it and you get those big shapes in. It's like three shapes, boom, you have a car, you have a face, yeah. you have whatever. Yeah. And how long have you been uh, teaching for? Uh, it's about 25 years now. And was it a natural transition into teaching? How did, how did that happen? Um, yeah, it was it was part of my sort of aim. When, once I turned fully professional, I thought, well, I, it'd be good to teach and, and earn some, you know, a little bit of income that way. Plus, you um, learn a lot. So yeah, so I so yeah, um, I, I I thought, well, I'll just try it. I mean, I'm not I'm not trained, but I thought I'll try it if i can't do it i won't do it um but you know i get some great feedback mainly from professional teachers lecturers everybody says you're a natural teacher keep doing hmm. it that's great yeah keep doing it and in that process of teaching you do learn a lot don't you you know you you, you research things yourself and, yeah yeah you know, what what's what do you think is like a good quality that makes someone a good teacher being able to communicate the ideas mm -hmm. and show the ideas, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Some artists more are oriented towards demos. I guess it's like, look at me paint. That's the best I can do. But there's this rare quality that that you probably have. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's what people tell me is you can do it and you can teach it as well. Is there anything you taught before in the past, maybe even when you were much younger, that you, or maybe instructed or enjoyed the teaching? No, 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 no I've not, not done anything like that. But um, hmm. I felt comfortable with the, doing, you know, the teaching painting. 
because it's something I, painting is obviously something I, I can do. Um, so, so it was nice to be able to communicate those, you know, techniques and things. And mm -hmm. What's the biggest thing you learned from teaching in terms of technique or watercolor? Uh, yeah, it's just, I think there's nothing, there's no sort of great, um, sort of, you know, wow moment, mm -hmm. but, um, it is literally the whole process of learning yourself. So, um, you know, some things you might avoid because they're difficult. Um, and if you're gonna teach it, then you need to know about it. So then you have to learn it. And then in learning, it, you, know, you, you progress. So teaching has, I think for me, has really progressed my work. Um, mm -hmm. you know. When I discover something that I'm, I'm really bad at and I, I don't want to learn, I know that's the one thing I need to learn always. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I had that with anatomy, which is kind of you know, just sketching and drawing. Uh, and, and I felt like, you know, in, in, like the integrity of knowing that I need to and I can be much better, I, I had to close the gap. Yeah. yeah. So I'm curious about something you said earlier. So when you did those uh, pen and pencil sketches, did it blow your mind how fast watercolor is? Because that's the one thing that if you go back to pen and ink or pencil, it's so much slower, you know what I mean? It is, yeah. And I think um, I've become an impatient painter. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. In what I've way? Get this down, you know, it's um, my paintings are focused. When I start, I, I finish and, and that's it. I don't leave a painting now or half finished. I can't mm. do that. I have, to, I have to see it through. So I'm not sure um, if I was to sit and do some pen and ink drawings for, you know, I don't know, eight, 10 hours, I'd probably I'd find it torture. <laughs> yeah, you'd lose your mind probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing that I read that you mentioned was uh, a lot of the ruggedness of the scenery, which is something that is really conveyed well in the paintings. And, and one of those things you do, and I'm curious about, that and how that was developed it seems like you throw a bunch of not even random they are they have some logic to them but just lines 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 squiggly lines branches everywhere to me that feels more like a compositional means rather than an actual thing that is there how do you approach it do you do you agree with that there's a lot going on um i mean it is it is part of the composition because you know Contrast in everything, big shapes, small shapes, um, fine lines and big brush marks. Um, so, so yeah, it's, um, it's part and parcel of that, but it will be something also that is there. And I think it's how you depict that as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I find that I would even loan from a different area in the scene, from one area to another, and just, just try and build something that from afar, again, in an abstract manner, will look good yeah yeah how do you teach that kind of a thing uh well you've got to do it through demonstration haven't you and um you know it's uh it's showing the technique but but allowing then the the painter or the student to interpret that in their own way you know because we we can't force something onto people it's 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 sort of um, handing over an idea and and then and then allowing them to, to develop that. Hmm. That's interesting. So would you say that's your that's your kind of overall maybe philosophy to teaching? You it is. Yeah, yeah. Because I try to get people to paint as they paint, paint who they are, mm -hmm. not not Paul Talbot Greaves clones. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's one of the probably biggest um, journeys as a part of the of, of learning is is to learn see things more like you actually see them, unlike what other people see them. Yeah. Yeah. I Was mean, there? Uh, yeah. yeah. Was there a point you felt like you arrived in that way? Meaning, before that kind of 
you, you weren't really sure what's your impression and then you felt not not to say that the growth stopped but you know what i mean like a critical kind of point where you're like okay i know what i want to convey and how i see things yeah i think i think for me it's, it's kind of conveying them but <clears throat> using the using the techniques that mean something to me so it that whole process you know you it comes out as as your painting you know it's got your stamp on it people can tell my work a mile away you know they see mm -hmm. a painting oh, that's paul talbot greaser's painting and that it's like handwriting isn't it you know that's that's your yeah. way of, of um, depicting it so so sometimes yeah i mean a lot of my a lot of the dialogue if you like in my work is um is kind of solitary so i never put many figures in if any um <laughs> and and it's depicting just a wild landscape um maybe animals now and again yeah so it's yeah it's, it's sort of i think that's kind of capturing my experience of how i see the landscape and mm. putting that onto paper you know it's fascinating because up until this point you i i never even noticed that there aren't any figures usually I do remember um, seeing maybe three or four paintings distinctly that had people walking in them. Uh, yeah. But now that you say that, I realize that it's kind of your signature. There usually it is empty of people. Yeah, and that's that's generally how the landscape is. You know, mm -hmm. certainly certainly in this area. You know, you don't always see people unless you're in a popular place. But I'm generally in the in the thick of the landscape where you might see a farmer but but you know <laughs> generally nobody else they're practically a part of the landscape in a way <laughs> yeah 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 but i think i'm i'm quite a solitary kind of person anyway so it's is i suppose it's a, a also you know through my vision it's it's kind of saying hey this is me in the landscape mm -hmm. you know nobody else here yeah yeah how does that play into teaching uh, if you're maybe solitary or maybe intro i don't know if you're an, an introvert but I, I mean you're definitely able to communicate things very well but does that influence it in a way uh in in what way for example the the method or maybe even just the way you structure the workshops and lessons uh so, so are you what the the introversion or yeah, yeah. does it affect it? I get it's super nervous really if I have to speak. No, I think I think I'm I'm very enthusiastic about sharing information and you know and, and helping people, seeing people learn, see a smile on their face because you know they've just picked up that <laughs> little ten percent nugget, you know that's made yeah, yeah, yeah. In their life and um, yeah, that that means a lot to me. So, so yeah, it's um, yeah, I'm I'm quite introvert, but. Um, it doesn't affect how I project myself because of the enthusiasm, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I I totally get it. I can be such an introvert in some situations and because people are used to seeing the videos, they never guess. But uh, in these situations where you're talking about something that you enjoy, you have so much passion for and you have so much experience in, I think a lot of it comes out. Yeah. And even if it's not in the form of speaking, it also shows in the paintings themselves that wild shadows running across. It's it's so good in that way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and and you know, lots of artists, probably most artists, are introvert anyway. You have to be right? <laughs> in your own little solitary world yeah, in sure. a way. Yeah, yeah, that's how you grow in a way. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I today love nothing more than spending a day experimenting just on my own you know mm -hmm. just yeah. me in the house maybe the radio on but um you know you lose yourself right i love the idea of locking yourself inside the studio with a bunch of supplies maybe even things you're not as used to you know what i mean because when you try a new medium sometimes you learn new things about the the other medium that you've been using did you experience that yeah that's exactly it um I, I i i got all sorts of things in and um, rollers you know scrapers everything i was trying all sorts of different mediums mm -hmm. different surfaces and you know what works for me what doesn't work for me um yeah I'm prepared to throw a lot of stuff away but um 
Well, essentially, that's kind of what you do at university, isn't it? You know, you, you yeah. experiment and and you you find what what works. I love that mindset, and you can tell when a student has it, right? Because some people they just they run through material; they don't care. They just want to get those insights and lessons. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. always try to encourage people to do the experiment stuff. For me. That when I was learning, that was far more enjoyable than creating a painting. Mm -hmm. you know, everyone wants to put the painting on the wall, put it in an exhibition and whatever. But, you know, try the experiment stuff as well. I used to make lovely worksheets. I get a half sheet of watercolor paper. I start in one corner and it might be, I don't know, I might want to improve trees. So I, so I start... <laughs> drawing and painting trees and making notes really important to make the notes because they're mm. and hmm. you know what what how can i improve that where where do i need to go next what do i need you know and then move on to the next one and the next one and i fill this sheet of trees and it becomes a hmm. work of art in itself yeah for sure and do you when you did that kind of a thing was it from imagination or using references using reference so i'd go out um Sometimes I'd sit and sketch or I'd take photos and, you know, even going up to into the woods and taking uh, rubbings of tree bark, you know, and mm. uh, looking at textures. So you're really going in close and, and moving back and sort of absorbing it. So, um, yeah, really important to do that. One thing I noticed that textures and, and the whole rugged idea, it, it does show that you're able to merge for one big layer, a few different, it's not just one wash. You do some texture kind of, even dry brushes that are a part of a larger wash that's kind of, um, you know, intersects with the, and, and that's really interesting. I find personally, when I try to do that, I, I'm very close to overworking or the colors don't work as well. But for you, it seems like, do you have any advice on that kind of a thing? Yeah, I mean, it's just part of the application. Every application is, uh, I think, is getting into your head the the, the edges and the, the way that you're dealing with those edges. Um, so it becomes second nature. Um, mm -hmm. You can practice those things on a fair piece of paper, work it out, just get used to it. And it does take time. But then as you're applying color, you automatically dealing with the edges as well. So it might be a ragged edge, it might be soft edge, you might want hard edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but if you focus on that, and only on that, you're not focusing on building the value or the color, you know, so you, it's got to become organic, it's got to become natural to you. And, and, um, and intuitive. This is the way forward. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ways I find most useful to to learn a new technique or to improve something and weak at is actually to work specifically on that. So I'll eliminate everything else. If my value control is weak, I'll work just on that, eliminate colors completely. Sometimes I'll focus on colors and then I'm kind of, kind of forgiving uh, with everything else. So I messed up the values, but the colors are truth. <laughs> but the colors are on point, you know, what? Bye. So do you do that kind of a thing too? Because it's filling in a complete sheet with just a specific subject is also, I guess, a part of it. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, um, sometimes it's kind of working out colors. It might be you get a little bit stale with the colors that you're using and you think, mm -hmm. oh, I'd like to introduce something new. So <laughs> yeah, try it out. You know, what happens if I put that alizarin into the yellow ochre? Um, mm -hmm. Is that going to tell? Is that going to say what I want to say? Sometimes I exaggerate the color, you know, and I, and I'll try it all that out first. I don't just jump in unless I know that it's going to work. Mm. Uh, yeah. So sure. Yeah. It's always every every aspect of painting is practice. Yeah, and you have to really brace yourself before you apply another wash or, or a layer or a large area, right? It's kind of like I need to make every, sure everything got everything mixed, got everything yeah, ready to go. Sometimes I like to work on adrenaline. Mm. And, uh, and so, you know, you can do this as well. Um, just do it, throw it on. <laughs> and then 
and then deal with it. You know, you've, it's almost like an emergency, isn't it? Then you've, mm -hmm. you've really got to act fast and do it. And I think you can learn a lot from that as well. With the water goes so immediate. Um, so, you know, in, in doing that, you, you learn to be immediate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'll find myself really messing and fiddling with small details. And I, I hate that. And then I'm like, it's like a pattern break. I'm like, okay, I take a few steps back. I squint my eyes. I just try to see the large shapes. And if I just reach for whatever intuitively feels like the right thing, it actually works much better. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. yeah I guess. You have to substitute sometimes that, that, that being too tight on the details with the flow, the flow supersedes everything in a way. You can have a very simple composition, very few shapes, right? And but as long as it's kind of flowing together, and maybe the value needs to be somewhere in the ballpark, right? But as long as that happens, it's going to be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it is getting that flow, I think, and 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 the energy. And when I'm approaching the end of a painting, I can really feel, you know, the heartbeat increasing, and uh, the the adrenaline's going. And things speed up sometimes, you know, rather than slowing down and being really mm -hmm. careful, I, I'm sort of really quite quick. And and again, it's that energy. That's where you get the, the life out of it, not worrying too much about that accuracy. Yeah. And that's something that you can't fully teach. The, the student has to experience that. I think it's it's a matter of experience, right? Yeah. And, and time, you know, it's the... the and frustration. You know, yeah, frustration. You keep, going, <laughs> keep going on that journey. You know, it's uh, it really is. The more that you do, the more you master. You know, there's so many parameters to to master. So the, the more you learn, um, the more it becomes second nature, and, mm -hmm. and that's when you can enjoy focusing on other aspects of it. You know, because you don't have to worry about that bit anymore. Yeah, the bigger picture. You can start really thinking about things in terms of not just the this dot that I'm focused on, and that yeah. th that's something I really noticed with my students that, that tendency to obsess over a misaligned kind of brush mark or something like that, where it's so counterintuitive, right? Yeah, absolutely. You can you can kill a painting with you know just being overly cautious. It can look mm -hmm. contrived if that you know that line is just perfect. Um, I always I call it the the perfect perfect imperfection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Aim for the imperfection, not the perfection. What's the subject that most excites you? Because you do have a few different uh, archetypes, if you will. There's the green landscapes. There's the more wintry. Uh, I love the wet roads that reflect the sky. That's genius. Like. So what's the thing that most excites you? Yeah, probably in in the UK, uh, sort of winter landscape. Not mm -hmm. when I say winter landscape, not so much the snow scene. They're they're really nice to paint, um, but but the winter colours. Mm -hmm. So going back to the oranges and the blues, yeah. you know, the browns and the subtle greens. Um, those are the those are the landscapes that I like to paint most. And then, and then, like you say, you know, the reflections and things that that's finding different things. I'm always looking for different things, you know, a puddle or a line of puddles that, that mm -hmm. just fire out of a strong value somewhere, you know, and, and then I work around it. I'll, I'll see something that I find fascinating and then I start to work my way around it and, and, I'm, and I look at it. Um, do you actually work around it? Do you start from that and work outwards? Sometimes, sometimes. But 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 what I mean when I say work around it, I'll I'll, I'll mm -hmm. look at that as a subject, and I'll and I'll try and work compositions around it. So you know, how can I make that mm -hmm. focus in this bigger landscape mm -hmm. and draw your attention to it? You know, it's um, yeah, structure uh, everything around it. Yeah, everything's structured around it. That's it. Hmm. That's interesting. That actually sparks something that I, I want to try. Yeah. You know how sometimes you, you like a spot and you, you and you actually start from it and kind of build everything in relations to that. And even though the technique is super messy and maybe you'll get some patchiness, it actually looks 
like you catch a you get a glimmer of that thing you know yeah absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. and uh that's how a lot of my compositions work you know i see i see something that that's interesting that i might think well that, that will make an interesting painting around that and then i i move around and i explore the the subject and 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 look at it as part of a bigger picture you know what what other aspects can i bring into it um to bring a or make it into an interesting composition and sometimes mm -hmm. it, it never works you know you sort of move on find another one yeah it's another experience to categorize and you know next time to do things yeah, differently yeah. yeah yeah how important is it to to actually paint something that you you enjoy or you love for me it's cars but you know vital vital why why would you paint anything else why mm -hmm. would you paint something you're not interested in you know so we do not even do that for just building experience or just the act of painting um, no because you, you're never going to get the best out of yourself if you, if you don't have that that core interest in it um you know why why do it we're going going back to school again now it's like you know I, I I was going to be an artist well why would I go and be a mathematician instead you know so find the things that, that fire you and and that's where you'll get the 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 best out of yourself you know and it may be that somewhere down the line in your journey you'll you might become interested in that anyway because you know your taste and vision changes doesn't it of course yeah yeah, I think it also changes geographically in that, like for me, I love the sun that we have here. So I always try to portray a, a very warm sunlight. So mm -hmm. a very particular kind of uh, red, yellow, orange sunlight, which is very different from a lot of the sunlight that you convey. Because to me, at least the way I interpret it, the sunlight is actually in the greens, even though very often you will have very strong highlights on those rocks on the wall. But the, the real sense of sunlight is in the greens to me. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, a lot of green in this country, very vibrant and reflective green, a lot of pasture, pasture land. Mm -hmm. um, and trees. I saw a recent one you did very nice with the cows and I think. Yeah, yeah. In the, was that in the valley bottom there? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's so nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, I, we, we joke about my greens, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, living here, you don't really notice too much. But um, whenever I've been away, you know, I'd sort of few years ago I was teaching down in Provence and it was in September time mm. brown and yellow and beautiful and flying back into the UK you know you sort of suddenly realize how green everything is really really green country is <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I find that it's really hard to nail the value on the greens because usually they're much lighter even or sometimes much darker than you'd think but often for me it's much lighter and I, I tend I find that to find that balance is really a challenging thing. You also experience that kind of a thing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, often when when I'm sort of analyzing my subject before I start painting, I'm looking for the lightest values. And, um, you know, they're, they're generally in the highlights, maybe on a road or a path and that kind of thing. And the green does look very similar to the hmm. light values but when you analyze it it's a it's another value stronger so it's they're they are quite rich and sometimes i do layer them up put a couple of layers on to, mm -hmm. to achieve that that strength do you use also more opaque types of green like a may green i know tends to be a little more glowy i have done yeah yeah may green is that the schminky color I believe they have one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a make green. because it has a bit of opacity to it, yeah. and sometimes when I feel like I wasn't able to get that, I glaze it over and it makes it brighter. Brighter. Yeah, sure. You take that and put some uh, cad yellow pale with it, you get a fantastic, mm -hmm. vibrant green. It's almost like working with gouache. Hmm. That's my next yeah. cheat. Yeah. <laughs> Give it a try. <laughs> you know, one of the things I I hate actually sometimes uh, cool yellows. So I wonder, what's your take on it? Are they uh, prevalent in your work? Is there a lot of it? 
cool yellows. Yeah, like a lemon yellow. Okay. Yeah, I'd use quite a bit of lemon yellow. Um, I should start. I... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I initially I'm... didn't like them, but now that I that I see them in use for so many works, I'm like, how how did I fail to achieve that so far? Yeah, uh, use uh, Hooker's Green and a bit of Winter Lemon. Wow, you know, you get this real, real vibrant uh, lime mm -hmm. green color. Perfect for those sunlit greens. You know, very vibrant, strong. I have yeah. a feeling after today I'm going to paint much more greens. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be looking for this. Oh, yeah. It's, now I have to do it. So one thing I wanted to ask, that's just from my own curiosity. Is there something major that, that oil painting taught you about watercolor? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, we touched on this earlier with um, different mediums, didn't we? And um, I find it's really, really useful to work in all mediums because you know, you pull techniques from one and put them into another. So, you know, the oil painting, putting colors side by side, working with thick color, that's exactly how I use the hmm. heavy values in my watercolor. Um, you know, and, um, and similarly with watercolor, you can apply um, similar techniques in oil glazing and that kind of thing, um, even if you want to splash solvent into it, whatever, you know, it's, um, I think it's really, really useful to, to use those techniques in, you know, they sort of interact between, mm -hmm. and, and that, again, that's, that's a way of, you know, um, maybe pushing your work a bit. So with yeah. my watercolor work quite often, I'll, I'll put some real thick, heavy color mm -hmm. in there first. So it's like I'm working with oil paint, with neat paint from the tube in no water bang in the darks and then going with the lights, you know, wow, hmm. look at all the rules. So, <laughs> you know, the rules are there to be broken. Well, there are no rules in painting. Yeah. You, should, yeah. you yeah. should do that. Definitely. And I'm curious, do you let it dry or do you immediately apply a wet wash over it? In the watercolor? If Yeah, in watercolor, if you put uh, something dark first. Uh, straight in there. So dark mm. goes in and then straight into the light, let it, I'm the same. it, let it dribble into it, you know. Um, mm. so in a way, it, it's easier water. It's easier than the other way around, than to put a wash and then battle that wet and wet. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly my thought on that. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to hit that dark value, then go in with it, you know. Put that only where it needs to be and then bring the mids and the lights up to it and, and just let them fuse and blend. So, so yeah, I think the more I progress with my watercolor work, the more oil techniques are coming into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. One thing I'm, I'm curious about, sometimes when I tackle a large wash, it's really, and this is just me selfishly getting free advice. I'll, <laughs> you know, you I, the, one, <laughs> that way everyone needs it. So I'll, I'll go through, there's, there's a thing of planning the shape and not only knowing where it's going to be, but the variation and value in it. And sometimes if you don't get started in from the right spot, you're, you have a higher risk of getting a patchy wash and having some edges blend. You know what I mean? And I'm curious how you tackle these. You have a wash, you know where to put everything and you want to make the most out of it. You want to get some variance in value and not just do a thin glaze and another thin glaze. And how do you tackle that? from a planning standpoint it just happens it happens wow thanks <laughs> yeah, you, you, I mean, the, as far as the planning goes i plan the composition and and get that drawn up um i plan i plan where the start is going to be so the lightest values they're going and mm. then i work in in sort of um in shape, so it's like my background might be one shape, it might be part of the foreground, another shape. But within mm -hmm. those shapes, because I divide it mentally into shapes, but there may be other, it may be made of many features or, or whatever. But um, yeah, the then the painting starts, and I and I really focus hard on those cores, you know, the color, shape, value, the edges, mm -hmm. um, 
and it doesn't always go right. It may look like I know what I'm doing, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but each shape that I tackle is is you know, a, a mini battle. You know, mm -hmm. there's lots going on there, and, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at the moisture. I'm looking at the thickness of the paint. I'm looking at the color. It might not be right. I might adjust it. I might then move on to the next shape. But I always then come back. And I could change things, you know, I can mm. uh, put more layers on, maybe a bit of drag brush, uh, maybe intensify the saturation a bit, or, or, or maybe add more value. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, yeah, that's the whole process for me is wrapped up in around about three layers. Mm -hmm. okay, but I, I, like, I like to have a bit of freedom. I don't like to sort of plot things to the and you can't degree. yeah and just like that has to be dark there that's going to be light there that's because i think there's a, a risk of of destroying the creative process mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. the, it's funny the, the description is you know, yeah yeah the way i see it it's exactly it's almost like you want to learn all the technical skills to the point they're fully intuitive and then you're most rewarded by the happy go lucky approach in a way yeah absolutely that yeah yeah so that's what makes it exciting isn't it you know <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> that's the best the freshness to it and, and we talked a lot the about water color because it's one <laughs> yes and everyone around is like wow we planned it so carefully in, in your yeah, head absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes sure, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. that everything <laughs> cool so i think this is a good point i have a, like a fire around kind of a few fun questions uh, that we can get into if you want to. And if anyone in the chat has questions, maybe you can ask them and we'll, we'll go over the chat maybe near the uh, afterwards, okay? Okay. So uh, first question will be summer or winter? Winter. Winter, yeah. I could guess based on what you said yeah. earlier. <laughs> um, no, okay. If you that's, that's one I like. If you could only use three colors for the rest of your life, which ones are they? Specifically, be specific. Uh, green is not an answer. <laughs> oh, wow. French ultramarine. Mm -hmm. Burnt sienna. Mm -hmm. And yellow ochre. Nice. Not so you're. Be... That, am I? But those... <laughs> <laughs> you set yourself up for no bright greens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, that's great. That's very natural colors. So you can get a lot of work done with the values. Um, what's a place that you haven't painted uh, that you would really like to paint or even painted in that you'd like to paint? South America. Mm. Anything in particular? Um, just like the plains of Argentina, you know, those lovely blues and yellows. The south. I see those pictures and I think one day. <laughs> yeah. Everything between Argentina and Chile, I've been there. It's insanely beautiful. And in a way, you have the, the da most dangerous uh, re um, subjects there because it's too beautiful almost. You get the, everything, like the ice and the snow and the green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the rainbows and everything, <laughs> everything is there. Um, how? What's the most paintings you painted in one day? It may be one. I don't know. I'm just throwing it. Uh, four, I think. Four. That's a yeah. lot. Yeah, that's yeah a lot. it is a lot. And were they really... Serious paintings? Yeah, they were. I think sometimes, you know, you get on a roll and you don't want to let go. Um, mm -hmm. And if you've got the time and the energy, then, yeah, sure, you can move from one to another. Yeah, four, four is a lot for, for, for major paintings. You really do need to be on a roll. Yeah, it's, that's not every day. <laughs> yeah, it's really demanding mentally, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any current hobbies aside from painting? Is, motorcycling uh, yeah. i Maybe. play a little bit of guitar nice yeah and a bit of writing yeah creative mm. writing creative writing meaning like just made up stories stuff like that yeah a little bit of made up stories bits of mm. factual stuff always with humor mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny i do the the opposite i just write down my thoughts in the morning like very dry and kind of you know Right. Okay. Oh, one thing relates to that. Do you have any 
kind of a routine that that sets you up in the morning for success or for being productive yeah coffee and <laughs> <laughs> i love this straightforward coffee, approach coffee and uh, maybe a little workout half hour workout you know, I think it's really good to get blood flowing, get a positive uh, yeah. going, either that or a walk, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question I'll ask after we look at just a few questions from the audience, uh, because I see they're quick and we can get to them. So uh, Lifters asks, size of paper you use most often, and you have mentioned it before, I just forgot. Yeah, half imperial size, so um, 20, 22 by 15 inch. What's that? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, Kimberly asks, please list your can't live without colors for your palette. So we kind of did a part of that, but is there anything you'd add? Seven yeah, green. sure. Seven green. <laughs> Seven green. Um, it's a yeah, must. Um, yeah, I mean, covering everything really. If we're going to expand on that, it would be cerulean blue. Uh, the sap green and some nice yellow, so maybe a mm -hmm. uh, or a cad yellow pale, because I like I like to use the opacity of some of these colors as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, and um, probably a lizarin crimson as well. I'd add into that. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of these colors. Very natural. Uh, yeah. Lefteris also asks if you could only select one medium, what would it be? And I can't believe I didn't ask that. Yeah, definitely watercolor. Well, yeah, thanks. For yes. that You're not just pandering. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> for real. <laughs> good, good, cool. So I will ask this. Um, what is there anything you're uh, particularly excited about for the future? Things you plan, something you want to promote, something like that? Um, yeah, it's uh, I've kind of been working on portraits more mm. lately. You won't have seen any, but um, mm. Yeah, that's something I'm developing. And really is this important. a scoop? Are we the first to hear? You are the first to hear. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so there will be there will be eventually some some portrait things appearing. Um, I really enjoy. It. I do a, a, a part of a little portrait group and, um, <clears throat> and we sketch and draw and paint and whatever. But I've been doing more serious sort of oil portraits, um, which yeah, I, I think. I really like form and and uh, again just depicting you know people and their and their personalities in a in a portrait and capturing the, the colors and what have you. So a bit different to landscape, but mm. there is the same aspect of I guess getting something natural happening, someone in their zone, someone else painting. That's a nice subject sometimes. Yeah, sure, mm. and captured with energy as well. You know, I like to get those brush mm -hmm. marks showing, not not a very polished portrait but really i love that chunky stuff and just um yeah i love it i find it when there's multiple glazes and they're all very smooth it's just more boring i love that in oils too by the way yeah 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 cool anything uh, else you want to share advice inspirational message <laughs> inspirational message just keep keep practicing keep learning uh, don't be frightened to learn, you know, and, and, and use those worksheets that I've talked about, not to not to constantly pressurize yourself into making fantastic paintings, you know, and, and aim mm -hmm. for the perfect imperfection. <laughs> I think that's the best advice you can give. We're going to squeeze one last by Tom. Tom asks from a guitarist doing a little painting to an artist who plays a little guitar. Is there an exercise for watercolor that you would consider most valuable, kind of the practicing scales of painting? Yeah, sure. What a good question that is, Tom. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I often I often compare learning uh, painting to music, you know, because hmm. uh, some people expect to be able to just paint. Oh, I'm going to do that. I'll paint today, you know, but um, you wouldn't expect to want to play piano and, and be able to play like Chopin. You know, you've got, you know that you expect you're going to have to learn those scales. So yes, learning those scales, definitely the value scales and and colors. You know, learn mm -hmm. about color mixing, how colors interact. So <clears throat> very important to know the color wheel and where your colors lie on the color wheel. So that's like learning your fretboard there, Tom. Uh, you know, and knowing each note on that on that guitar scale, knowing where your colors lie, but in here, 
and then you can <laughs> pull it out the back. I absolutely love it. Thank you so much. That's amazing. So I'm going to put, the, as I mentioned earlier, links to uh, your Instagram and website. Uh, so definitely everyone here should go and check it out. Look at your paintings. I hope to get one for myself, by the way. Um, and I really do appreciate your time. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you very much. Very kind. Yeah, great to and, you. And I'm going to end it for everyone, but we're going to stay in chat for a few more minutes, okay? So thank you to everyone who was here, spent some time with us. The live stream is going to stay. If you had to bail out or you came late, it will be here. So thank you so, so much, and we'll talk to you again real soon.